today. And as Joe said, we have a, a soft spot in our hearts for this church. And we have a long history with this church, and so it's a privilege to be here. And what I would like to do today is share a little bit about the work that God's doing in Japan and some of the gospel need in Japan, which is tremendous. And then share a little bit from the scriptures with you all today. So my wife and I have been with our two children in Hiroshima, Japan for, as Joe said, about a year and a half. And right now we are on a team which has seven adults has three married couples and one single woman, and she is actually from Korea, she's from Seoul. So we have a good connection with her. And from our time when we lived here in Busan, we grew a great love for Korean food, and she's a great cook. So she cooks for us and we enjoy it. The, the team that we're on is focused with planting churches and focused with bringing the gospel to Japan. And there is a great need There's a great, oh, it's a lot louder. I want to share a little bit about the great need in Japan for the gospel. The team that we're working with wants to work with Japanese churches, and right now we're partnering with three small Japanese churches that are in Hiroshima. And the long term vision is to see churches planted throughout the region and see Japanese come to Christ. But a little bit more about our history here with this church that sort of led us to Japan and got us involved with Asia in the first place. When my wife and I moved here in 2007 as English teachers, ICC was just starting and that was before there was an R. It was just ICC, International Community Church. My wife told me to say that. That was, that was good. Uh, we actually uh, helped as it was beginning with James and Soan, who are also here today, they happened to be visiting. And at that time, ICC was very small. But we really enjoyed it, and we enjoyed laboring together. And that was our first exposure to living in Asia. And through that experience, God gave us a joy of living in Asia and a love for living in Asia. And so that really opened the door for us to later enter Japan and find a, a, a good connection with Japan. At first we thought that God was going to send us to Africa as missionaries. And we went there, actually ICC sent us to Africa in 2012 just to check it out. We were planning on going to the country of Mozambique. And God quickly made it clear that that was not for us. And he sort of turned our hearts back to Asia. And we started to think about the great need in Japan. Oftentimes, if you hear a missionary or someone talking about uh, the need of a mission field, they'll give you lots of numbers. And they'll give you lots of percentages and lots of facts and figures. And sometimes those are helpful, but sometimes we, our minds sort of disconnect when you start to hear lots of numbers. So for example, if I told you that in Japan there are 127 million people and less than 1% of them know Jesus, that's a true fact. And that's a fact that should stun you if you think about it. Less than 1% of 127 million people do not know the God that made them. So that is stunning, but still it, it's hard to sort of grab that. So I want to tell you a story of an experience that I had that helps to illustrate the lostness of the people of Japan. They are a beautiful people, a special people, and a, a really intelligent people, but they do not know God, and that's why we are there. So after I left Korea in 2012, my wife and I moved back to the United States. So this is the period between living in Korea and moving to Japan as missionaries. We were back in the States for about five or six years. And during that time, I was a hospice chaplain. And if you're not familiar with hospice care, hospice care is providing end-of-life care to terminally ill patients. So I was a chaplain, so my job was to provide spiritual and emotional support to these people as they were at the end of their lives. And oftentimes, because I was the chaplain and because I was the minister, I would have conversations with these patients about their thoughts about God, their thoughts about what would happen after they die, their thoughts about the afterlife. And so it wasn't uncommon for me, if the situation came up, to talk with a patient that I was visiting and say, if you passed away today and you were standing before God and God asked you, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? When I asked a patient that question, they were never shocked. They, they had sort of a frame of reference for why I was asking that. 
And even if they weren't a Christian, even if they didn't come from a Christian background, there was still this sort of frame where they thought, okay, I understand why he's asking this. And I understand that it's important to think about God and it's important to think about what will happen to me after I die. Even though maybe I'm not a Christian or I don't care about this Jesus that he's sharing with me, I understand why it's important to think about those things. But if I asked that question to someone in Japan, and I said to them, if you died today and you stood before God, and he asked you, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? That question would be almost unintelligible to a Japanese person because it's so foreign to their worldview to ask a question about the afterlife and God and those, those big questions. That's usually not what a Japanese person is thinking about. Japanese society is very focused on becoming sort of a unit. You need to know what your role is in society and you need to play that role. So in your family, and in your workplace, and in all these different relationships that you have, your job is just not to rock the boat. And your job is just to be successful and to do your task well. So if you have a good job, and you're showing up to work on time, and you're keeping all of your family obligations, you're living the good life. So you're not really thinking about God or what happens after you die. Those are just not questions that are usually in a Japanese person's mind. I recently read an article and one author said that Sure. Okay. Back to wireless. One author recently said, in Japan, people don't make space for transcendence. So transcendence, thinking about this idea of things that go beyond the here and now, that's usually not something that's going through the mindset there. So as we're in Japan and we're trying to make relationships, and we're trying to share the good news of Jesus, one of the challenges is just putting it into the context of the Japanese mindset in a way that's intelligible and in a way that makes sense. So there's, there are so many building blocks that need to happen between you forming a friendship with someone and then inviting them to church or sharing the gospel with them. And so we'd ask you to pray for us and pray for the Japanese people. They are hungry for something they don't know what and they don't know how to frame it. But oftentimes, Japanese people, if you can get them to enter a church, and it's a church where there's a lot of love and a lot of community, they speak about, they speak about the importance of that relationship that they see between the members of the church. And a lot of times, they'll continue to come, even if they never intend to be a Christian. When they enter a place where they actually see this fellowship, this community, even though they don't exactly know what's going on or what's bonding these people, they like it. So we have a friend who is a missionary in Fukuoka, Japan, and one of the ways that he reaches out is he goes to the gym. And he met a man at the gym probably in his 80s. And the man had never thought about Jesus before, never thought about the gospel, but they struck up a relationship and finally my friend invited him to church. And he went. And he told my friend, I never intend to become a Christian. This is not for me. But when I come here, I feel love. And I plan to come to this church until I die. So there is something about Christian unity that even if the message itself doesn't pierce their hearts at the beginning, Christian love and Christian unity touches people's hearts. And so one of the things that we want to do is just allow unbelievers to be around that Christian community and see the love of Christ. And that's what Jesus said, right? The world will know that you're mine by your love for one another, and that will attract the world. So the task is so tremendous in Japan, and it's such a different place than in Korea where you see churches in so many different areas of the city. So we'd ask you to pray for Japan, pray for our team. It's small. And also please pray for our family. Some of you saw my daughter. Uh, she's almost five. And she's in an all-Japanese-speaking preschool. So five days a week, she's in this preschool. She's learning Japanese, but of course there are challenges. And sometimes, even in English, she doesn't know how to express herself. So imagine all day long being in an environment where you're just kind of learning the language, but you don't really know what's happening. And that's where you live for several hours a day, five days a week. So as parents, one of our challenges is just how do we best love our kids? And how do we best make sure they have what they need while at the same time saying, yes, we will sacrifice for the gospel. We will sacrifice living in our comfort zone and come to Japan. So there is this sort of medium that's very difficult to find. 
as you're raising kids in this environment. So please pray for our family and pray for us as we learn Japanese. It is not easy, but we're trying to take the long view. And so we know that if we want to be effective in the long run, we have to know the language. And so pray for us as we try to learn that. So our ministry right now is learning the language, and we're also involved with a very small bilingual church that has a monthly meeting. And I'm, I usually speak there, but I usually have a translator. So I was kind of afraid about speaking here today because I thought I'd either go too fast or awkwardly stop in the middle of a sentence because I'm so used to cutting myself off in the middle of a thought to let someone translate. So if I'm going too fast, someone just tell me because this actually feels really good, but it's a little free. I, I, <laughs> Joe told me to have a good time. So we'd like you to think about Japan and pray for Japan. When we started sharing in the States as we were raising our friends about the need in Japan, a lot of people said, I never knew. And some people even said, I just kind of figured it was the same as Korea because they're so close. But really, it's, it's worlds apart. And uh, there is a tremendous need there for the gospel. But God is working. And God, we are seeing more missionaries come. We've only been there for a year and a half. But missionaries that have been there for a long time have told us that probably within the last three to five years, they're seeing a huge influx in new people that are coming to Japan and they're interested in returning as missionaries. So God is working. And we're going to see this in our message today. The gospel can't be stopped. And God is the one that will spread his kingdom and grow his kingdom. And uh, we have the privilege of partnering with him. So God's working in Japan, but we'd love you to uh, pray for his work to continue there. I talked with Pastor Micah before I came, and he said, you guys are going through a series on parables. And so I started to think about how I could sort of come alongside that. And we're going to share, I'm going to share today one of Christ's parables. It's called the parable of the mustard seed, and it's from Matthew chapter 13. And this complements well the work that God's doing in Japan and our missions efforts in Japan. And of course, it continues the theme of the parables. So I hope that it, it fits right in, and I hope that um, it speaks to you today. As we go through the teachings of Jesus Christ, we have a great privilege. And the older I get, and the more that I read the teachings of Jesus, the more I see how wonderful of a teacher he was. If you've ever been in school with a bad teacher that's extremely boring, you know the difference between a good teacher and a bad teacher. You know the difference between someone that can take a very complex theme and make it simple and make it understandable, or someone that just gives you dry academic facts that don't really connect. Jesus was a master storyteller and a master teacher who used very simple everyday objects to illustrate some very profound spiritual truths. So for example, in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus is calling his followers to be different from the world and to follow God's way instead of the world's way, and when he's telling them that he wants his disciples to influence the world and influence culture in a positive way, Jesus doesn't just say, listen, I want you to impact the culture. I want you to help the culture. And to do this, I want you to do A and B and C. And if you do that, then God's way will help change people's hearts. It's not this dry presentation. Instead, Jesus gives his disciples a picture. He says, I want you to be salt and I want you to be light. And right away when he starts using these metaphors, you can already see what he's getting at. He wants them to influence culture. He wants disciples to touch the world in a positive way. But he uses the idea of salt, which brings flavor and it preserves the meat. It makes it better when it touches it. And then uses the picture of light. Light chases away the darkness. Light helps everything that it touches. So already the disciples are saying, yes, I want to help preserve society, help make it a better place, help bring God's light here. That's what Jesus does when he teaches. And today, he uses a different analogy. He uses the analogy of a seed. And a seed is something that's very, very special if you actually think about it. And it's a perfect illustration, and Jesus used it a lot when he was teaching various truths. I read an article a few years back about Leonardo da Vinci, the great illustrator and the great inventor and artist. And the article said that one of the reasons da Vinci was such a great inventor and he had such a wonderful mind is he never stopped being curious. 
That was one of the driving forces in da Vinci's mind. He never gave up his curiosity. And the article says this, much of his curiosity was applied to topics that most of us have outgrown even noticing. Take the blue sky, for example. We see it every day, but not since childhood have we wondered why it's blue. There are things all around us in this world that are amazing, but we kind of lose our curiosity. But my daughter, being only four, still has this great childhood curiosity. The world is an amazing place to her. And one day a while back, we were eating an apple together. And we got to the core in the middle. We got to the seeds. And she's so curious about seeds. And we told her, if you put one of those in the ground and you do it the right way, it can grow into a tree. And she said, this is amazing. She said, let's plant it right now. So we had to go out in the backyard. And somewhere in this, this small house in the Midwest in America, there is a seed under the ground somewhere. And she still wants to go back and see if the tree grew. And I haven't told her that it probably didn't. But she's very curious about seeds. And if you actually think about it, a seed is an amazing thing, right? It starts out as this, this very small object. You put it in the ground, these different elements touch the seed, nourish the seed, and then the end result is something completely different and a lot larger than the beginning, right? Jesus uses the seed for that very reason. So apparently Jesus also thought seeds were amazing and he used the seed to illustrate how God's kingdom grows in Matthew chapter 13. So I'm going to read it. This is Matthew chapter 13 verses 31 to 32. Two short verses for us today to walk through. And then I'm just going to share a few remarks and we'll see what God has to say to us about the growth of his kingdom. Matthew 13, verses 31 to 32. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Join me in prayer as I ask for God's blessing on our word today. Father, we worship you. You are great. You are greater than each of us, and yet you love us. Thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus. Thank you that you've recorded in your word his teachings. Please humble us today under his word. In spirit, please fill us and help us to understand what you're speaking today. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 13, the chapter that this parable is found in, is a chapter that's committed to the kingdom of God. Jesus is telling all of these short stories and all of these short parables about what the kingdom looks like. He's talking about who's in the kingdom and who's out of the kingdom. He's talking about how the kingdom grows. He's talking about what the kingdom actually looks like. And this idea of the kingdom is very prominent throughout the book of Matthew. And so as we talk about the kingdom, I just want to sort of, in just one minute, give a sketch of what Jesus is referring to when he talks about the kingdom. Because it's a little bit vague sometimes if we don't really try to nail it down. But if we're going to talk about a mustard seed being a picture of the kingdom, what exactly are we talking about? If you look just in the book of Matthew, several different sections describe the kingdom. And I want to share three. The first is, this is one of the, these are three ways we can look at the kingdom from Matthew. First, the kingdom of heaven is the place where the power of God overcomes the power of evil. The kingdom of God is the place where the power of God overcomes the powers of evil. So, for example, when Jesus is doing his ministry and he casts out demons, he tells the Pharisees, if I am in your presence casting out demons by the power of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom power arrived with Christ and it's expressed in his ministry when he shows that Satan, the strong man, has been bound, as Jesus says, and his demons and his workers are being cast out and overcome by King Jesus. That's a powerful thing. God's kingdom is breaking into this world and the world system is fleeing under the power and the reign of King Jesus. 
Secondly, in the book of Matthew, we see that the kingdom can also be understood as the place where King Jesus reigns in his glory. So he takes his disciples up onto a mountain privately, and he sort of takes away the robe of his humanity, and he shows them his divine majesty, and he's shining so white that they can't look at him. And the Bible says that when he does that, he's showing his kingdom glory. So the kingdom is where Jesus reigns and the powers of darkness flee. It's where Jesus reigns in kingly glory. And it's also where God's people submit to the king and to his ways. So the Sermon on the Mount is all about kingdom living. And so we come to Jesus and instead of following the world's way, we follow Christ's way. So someone slaps us, we don't get revenge, we don't retaliate like the world system says. Instead, we turn the other cheek. The world says to be proud, to be strong, to assert your power and your authority. And Jesus says, be humble. Jesus says, wash your brother's feet. Jesus enters Jerusalem on a donkey, not a war horse, to show his humility. So the kingdom is this special place where Jesus reigns and God's people follow. And this kingdom is spreading. The reign of God through King Jesus is spreading. So that's what Jesus is referring to when he talks about the kingdom. And then that brings us to our parable. It's a very simple parable. There's a farmer. He's in his field. He has a handful of seeds. And he's throwing them into the ground. He's sowing his seeds in his field. Very simple, right? It's, you don't actually need me today. You could just read these two verses. But it is interesting to note that Jesus specifies the kind of seeds that the farmer is using. It says that he's throwing out grains of mustard seeds. And this specifies that the mustard seed was the smallest of all seeds. So Jesus here has something special in mind. He specifically chose the mustard seed because of its very tiny size. And in fact, you can fit on the tip of your finger several grains of a mustard seed. Several of these small seeds would fit on your fingertip. Extremely small, right? So Jesus is indicating that there's something small in the beginning of this seed. But he compares the beginning with the end. Notice what he says. It's the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it's larger than all the garden plants. Can you see the, the contrast there? Super, super, super small at the beginning. The smallest of all seeds. Minuscule. But then at the end, it's so large, you cannot deny what exists. The seed became something so amazing that the very end of it is very impressive. So there's a point here that Jesus is making. First, it's very clear to see that seeds are grown by God. The farmer can put them in the ground and the farmer can water the ground, but the farmer can't make the seeds grow. God is the one that causes the seed to sprout and to grow and to grow and to finally reach its fullest expression. Man and women cannot make that happen. Missionaries and pastors and people cannot make the kingdom grow. You see the parallel here, what Jesus is doing. He's saying, look at something so simple as a mustard tree. It starts small, in the end it's bigger than all the other trees in the garden. And in fact, it's so big that its nests, or that its branches can support birds building nests. That's what the kingdom is like. And when we look back at the ministry of Jesus, we can see that it's true. So here we are today in Korea, very, very far from Israel. And here we are following the teachings of this man two millennia ago, who was a carpenter, living in a small town, wandering around a small country that was occupied by a foreign government, by the Roman Empire. No one was really too impressed with what was going on in Israel. And yet he says that there is something, there is this spiritual entity, there is this thing where God reigns. And it starts so small with the teaching of Christ. But then in the end, it's humongous. And how does Jesus spread his message? 
He gets fishermen and tax collectors and everyday people. And he tells them, take this message and don't just stop inside of Israel. Go around the world with this message. Other people in Christ's day told parables. Other rabbis in Christ's day had followers. But we're not here today listening to what they said because history has forgotten them. But the kingdom of God has spread and spread and spread, not by our efforts, but by God's own efforts and God's own strength and God's own power. And now today, the seed has sprouted into this massive tree that's all over the world and it has reached this full, full expression and it's continuing to expand and it will do so until Christ comes back. So when we look at this parable, even though it's just two verses, it's very simple. It's very profound. It speaks to the power of God. It speaks to the inability of humans to make anything happen. It speaks to the trustworthiness and the truthfulness of Jesus Christ. And it reminds us that we should be involved. Even though we don't cause it to happen, God calls us to be involved as the kingdom continues to expand. And so we pray, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the mustard seed continues to expand. But there's one more important element, if you notice. In verse 32, Jesus says that the birds of the air build their nests in the branches of these trees. Now, I'm sure probably Micah has mentioned this, but in parables, they're a little tricky sometimes. Because you have to ask yourself, does everything that's mentioned have a deeper significance? Is everything that's mentioned a symbol for something else? So we understand, of course, that the seed is a symbol for the kingdom because Jesus says the kingdom is like a seed, right? So he already explains it for us. But when Jesus mentions the birds, he doesn't explain if the birds have any significance. So if you read different books, there are all sorts of different ideas about these birds. What are the birds in these trees? Some people say the birds have no meaning. Jesus is just painting the picture. And as he paints the picture, he wants to put birds in the trees, and it just kind of gives you a, a better mental picture. And then other people say, no, these birds, these represent evil. Because earlier in Matthew chapter 13, there's another story, and there's another farmer throwing seeds, but the birds come, and they eat the seed before it can be planted. And that's a picture of evil forces that take away the gospel before somebody believes. And then other people say, no, 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 the birds mean this, and they mean this. So there are all these different ways of understanding it, but I want to tell you what I think Jesus is saying, and I want to tell you why. Because I think it has significance, and I think it matches well with the entire theme of the book of Matthew. When Jesus says that in the end the kingdom is fully grown, and the birds of the air come and make nests in the branches of this huge mustard tree, I think he's referring to Gentiles, to people that are not Jewish. And there's a reason for that. Jesus, of course, being a master teacher, knew the Old Testament well in the Bible. And there are two places in the Old Testament, in the book of Ezekiel, where there is this exact same picture given. There's this tree that's humongous. It has these large, strong, sturdy branches. And these birds of the air come and make nests in the branches. And in Ezekiel, it's very clear that these birds represent the nations. So there's this place where all of these nations are coming and they're nesting and they're congregating in one place. And if you look at the entire book of Matthew, one of Jesus' teachings that was so shocking was the fact that the kingdom was not just for the Jewish people, right? So in Jesus' day, you have to understand that the, the environment that he's living in has all of these religiously fanatic Jewish people who are saying, we are God's chosen people. The kingdom is for us. Gentiles, non-Jewish people, are dogs. They're not going to get in, but we're going to get in. And then Jesus comes on the scene, and Jesus says, actually, at the end of time, there's going to be this great feast. And at this great feast, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all of the fathers of Judaism are going to be there. And all of these people are going to gather with them. And guess what? Many of you Jewish people are not going to be at the feast, but... These people from all around the world will come and they will dine 
with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the Jews are stunned. He's telling them, you're not going to make it because you're self-righteous and because you think you're in because you're Jewish. But over here you have these unclean people who trust in me and who are humble before God. They will be in God's kingdom family. They will attend God's kingdom feast. So Jesus does this throughout the book of Matthew. Again and again he tells these stories and he addresses these, these Pharisees and these self-righteous people and he's telling them that in the end it's not going to be what they imagine. God's kingdom will spread and the Gentiles will come in. So I think what Jesus is saying here is that at the end of time, or now as the tree expands, the nations will come. Koreans will come. People from the West will come. They will enter his family through faith. And they will find their safety in God's tree, you might say. So that's what I think Jesus is saying. And there are other people that are much smarter than me that disagree, but I think it matches with the overall flow of Matthew, and I think it also matches with Ezekiel. If that's true, that's very good news for us. God's kingdom is for us. And we have the joy of sharing the news of this kingdom with anybody worldwide. And as Joe said at the beginning today, sometimes we sing songs and they lose their significance. And because of the setting that we're in, and of course we weren't alive in Jesus' day, I think we forget how splendid it is that the God of the Bible, the God of the Old Testament, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has his arms open. And he's not saying, no, you're not allowed because you're not Jewish. He's welcoming the entire world in. And if you're a Christian... One of the things Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount is he gives you all of these privileges of being one, one of God's people and then he pushes you back out into the world. And he says, go, be salt, be light. Go, share the news of this kingdom. So as we see that God is welcoming the nations in and as we see that this tree is still expanding that is a fuel for Christian missions. Some people have very shallow understanding of Christian missions and they say, well, there are people and they need to go to heaven so we, we have to go. We have to tell them. And of course that's true, but it goes so much deeper than that. It's about the glory of God. It's about the name of Christ being shared where he's not been shared before. It's about the kingdom of God advancing into enemy territory and the powers of darkness being pushed out and people bending their knee under King Jesus, even when it means that they will lose their families or lose their lives. So as we are in Japan, as we want to plant churches, each time a church is planted, you can say that it's an outpost of God's kingdom. It's, it's a representation on earth of God's kingdom. And then God's people gather together, they bow themselves, they humble themselves under God's word, they kneel before King Jesus, and then they're scattered. And then they share a better way. And that's how God's kingdom is spread. That's how it goes. And so as we're in Japan and as we ask you to pray about Japan, it's not just that they haven't heard about Jesus. That's part of it. But it's that God's kingdom must go. And God calls us to be involved. And God will give the increase. And his spirit will grow the mustard tree. And it's still spreading into regions all around the world. And it's a phenomenal thing that you and I get to be involved in that. And watch that. And pray with that. And give money toward that. And that is why we do missions. Because the mustard seed continues to go on. Well, what do we say to close it all? Two verses. King Jesus speaks, we listen, and we move. So I just want to encourage you, share the gospel where you have opportunity. Be aware of what God's doing throughout the world in very hard places. We know that the gospel is true because we see God's spirit opening up people's hearts and we see this kingdom spreading into places where world governments are trying to keep it out, but they cannot stop it. But we see people giving their lives in order to enter this kingdom. So be aware, pray, and think of all the wonderful things that Jesus is doing as this mustard seed expands. It's been really good to be with you and thank you for letting me share with you today. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your kingdom. 
Thank you that we get to be involved. This is about you. This meeting today is about you. It's not about us. It's not about me. It's not about the people singing or the people that are gathered. It's about your honor and your glory. We pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. Thanks so much, Patrick. We're going to continue worshiping the Lord in a few different ways. First of all, we're going to be remembering the Lord Jesus by taking communion together. And uh, I think this is such a beautiful way to think about this, that 2,000 years ago there was this Jewish rabbi who was so much more than a Jewish rabbi. He was the Son of God and the Son of Man. And he died in our place so that we could be forgiven of our sins and we could stand in righteousness in front of God. And that small seed that he planted all those years ago as he walked around the Judean countryside has grown up so big that here we are far away in another country and all of us from a lot of different countries here to remember Jesus who died for our sins. So that's what we're going to be doing this morning. We're going to be taking communion together and uh, remembering his broken body and his blood that was shed for us. Another way that we're going to continue worshiping the Lord is by giving our gifts and our offerings. So we'll have our offering box in the back corner over there. And this is primarily for members. If you're a member of the church, then this is the time for you to give. And if you are not a member, then um, you can give if you'd like to, but it is, not, it is not compulsory for you to do so. And finally, I'm going to be over in this corner over here to pray with you. So if you'd like someone to pray with, then I'll be available for you there. So let's continue worshiping the Lord together in these ways.